Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I, uh, I've been sort of distracted because I've been flying a lot, you know, these unmanned aircraft and haven't been in, in the ocean as much as I'd like to. So being back here with a bunch of people interested in ocean exploration is a real treat. Um, I, uh, I've been shooting underwater for about 13 years. Um, it happened pretty much on accident and I was, uh, I was keeping reef tanks. I was really interested in fish and coral as a result. And uh, you know, like the waste cycle, all these things you have to be, you have to think about when you're, you're trying to raise things in captivity. Um, but then I, I realized that it was actually much better just to go see these things in the wild. And uh, I was an amateur photographer at the time. And when the two met, I took a camera underwater for the first time in 2001, and everything sort of, uh, well, it sort of derailed my life. You know, I was a software guy working in engineering. I quit my job, and I started taking a lot of pictures and doing publishing work, writing about what I was interested in um, just on a website that was all uh, a bunch of people interested in digital photography underwater, which was not being treated seriously. And, um, and it took over my life. And I spent the next 10 years in the field, sort of six months a year, and um, uh, just exploring these worlds that uh, most people had never seen. One of the first places I went to was Palau. Actually, the first time I took a camera underwater uh, was on a trip to Palau, which was chosen without any reason. You know, I pretty much just, I looked for the cheapest liveaboard trip I could find, and it happened to be on the Big Blue Explorer in Palau at the time. It was like $1,600. And, um, and I picked up a cam uh, housing, underwater housing, for my point-and-shoot digital camera, a Nikon Coolpix 990. Um, and it, it arrived, and I just like took it there, and put my camera in and went underwater and took some terrible pictures, which I'm not going to show you. But they are online, so if you're interested. Uh, yeah, I've actually had people go to my website and find this uh, trip report that I put up and write me an email that says, thank you so much for putting these pictures online. I now have hope for my, <laughs> my own skills going forward. All right, so Palau's here. It's really remote, and most of the places we go to are extremely remote, and it's beautiful. Um, it's basically, you know, tropical paradise. There are about 250 islands in Palau and Micronesia. And this is what it looks like for most people when they go there. Um, but for us, it looks like this. Basically, there are lots of fish there. And most divers have heard of Palau uh, basically because it has r amazing rich fish and coral uh, life. And so you see, um, you know, big schools of jacks, barracuda, um, actually, the thing that I like the best about Palau isn't the normal diving that people do. It's really um, this lake. So there's a, a, real, a secret, uh, it's not that secret now, but it's a, a landlocked lake, uh, and you have to hike over a ridge uh, with trees that are literally dripping poison sap. <laughs> there are signs that uh, say this. Um, and it's called Jellyfish Lake. And, of course, the reason it's called Jellyfish Lake is that there are jellyfish in it. And um, this lake has been isolated for, I think, about 12,000 years, according to Wikipedia, the source of all knowledge. And um, these jellies are uh, called golden jellies. And they've been isolated from the ocean for, for that amount of time. And as a result, they've lost most of their stinging ability because there aren't predators uh, that are trying to eat them there, except for uh, sea anemones. And, um, and so they host symbiotic algae, and they sort of follow the sun around during the day. They migrate looking for sunlight so that they can uh, feed off the energy that the algae hosted in their bodies produce. So what's really great is there are, there are a lot of jellies here. And because they don't sting, you can swim through them. Um, and uh, if you're allergic to jellies, uh, it turns out that they do sting a little bit. <laughs> um, but they don't sting enough for you to feel it on, on most of your body. So I have seen people swell up after swimming through these. 
So if you're going to go here, find out whether you're allergic to jellies first. Um, and this lake is, is, is incredible. Um, you can spend a lot of time there being you know, a little bit more creative with your photography. Um, we're on snorkel here. Uh, you can't scuba dive here because um, starting from about 15 meters, there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide in the water which can absorb in your skin. Apparently it does bad things. So they, they don't allow diving. Um, but you can snorkel as much as you, as you want. And um, this is actually the shot I got that I like the most. Um, one of my favorite pictures there. It did take three trips to the lake uh, to get this shot. It's not always like this. I mean, the jellies are there, but uh, their populations vary. And, um, and depending on conditions, uh, they may or may not be you know, this densely packed together. But highly recommended if you go to Palau, find this lake. Um, and go for a swim. <laughs> so this is, a, this is another location. Um, I took this snapshot from Google Earth. Um, this is kind of a typical tropical island you might imagine that divers would go to. Um, what's not typical is that it is extremely remote. Well, typical for us. Um, this is uh, Cocos Island, which is off the coast of uh, Costa Rica. And you fly in to San Jose and you take a boat for 36 hours to get there. So it can be pretty brutal getting there if, you're, if you don't like boats or the ocean. Um, the trip I did actually ended up going an additional 40 hours to an island called Malpelo, which is Colombian. Um, and then of course you have to get back. So this is the route we took. It was a 17 day trip. And, um, and this is what Malpelo looks like. So this is the only part that sticks up on the land there. And as a result, um, it, it's really, uh, it can be a little bit dicey being there on a boat because there's nowhere to hide from weather. So if weather picks up, you have to leave. And of course, the closest point you can go to is 40 hours away. <laughs> um, Cocos is, is different. It's very tropical and lush. And um, you can go for hikes. Nobody lives on the island, although there is a ranger station. and um, it's so interesting underwater that a friend of mine built a submarine, which is based there for research um, and tourism. So you can actually go here in the sub and, uh, and go underwater. I went underwater to take pictures of it, which was a lot of fun because it's not a typical subject you get as a diver. And someone inside took a picture of me right there, <laughs> which is cool. Um, so what these islands are known for, these um, very remote islands, uh, kind of in the Eastern Pacific, are their fish life. So it's the only thing sticking up from the ocean for hundreds of miles around, uh, and that results in aggregations of, uh, of fish. So again, jacks, barracudas, so the normal things you see in places like this. I really like uh, what surge does, you know, this, the movement of water back and forth. It creates really, really turbulent um, shallow reef scenes, you know, these are, this, these are bubbles kind of being thrown up by the, um, by the surge. Uh, the water is rushing in and out of this little um, canyon there. And it sometimes can create interesting backdrops. So this is a column of bubbles and it looks like clouds when you're underwater. Um, it's, it's really, really cool. So there are lots of fish here and when you get closer to the rocks, uh, sometimes the fish are like walls. You know, you can literally become lost inside them. Uh, and some of the fish are really friendly. This is a leather bass. It's playing in bubbles and sort of checking out my friend Heidi here. You have other kinds of animals there. Uh, green sea turtle, the occasional octopus hiding on the reef. This is one of the first trips that I did uh, video in. This is um, an old housing for a Sony camcorder uh, back from 2007. And the real reason people come here is actually for the shark life. So, you know, when you're looking at fish, sometimes you'll see little shadows in the distance. And um, those are hammerhead sharks. And both Cocos and Malpelo are known for being one of the, well, two of the best places where you can find hammerhead sharks underwater. So these are scalloped, scalloped hammerhead sharks. They're the ones that you see in pictures of schools of hammerheads. And um, it's one of the last places you can find big populations of hammerhead sharks are Cocos and, and Mapello. 
All of this diving is done pretty deep these days. This is at a site called Alcyon, which was named by Jacques Cousteau. And uh, the dive starts at about 90 feet and just goes deeper. And um, you have a really good chance of seeing schools of hammerheads here. And what they're doing here is being cleaned. So these little butterfly fish are picking parasites off of these hammerheads. And, uh, and so they sort of, fish will go to what we call a cleaning station and they'll sort of stall in the water and these fish will come and pick parasites off them. It seems unlikely. That's what they're there for. And so I went for years looking for big schools of hammerheads and I was not a rebreather diver and it turns out that hammerheads are afraid of bubbles, <laughs> which makes it difficult to get close to them. Um, and I finally had everything come together one year in the Galapagos. And uh, similar to places like Cocos, there are lots of hammerheads there. And um, everything came together um, on one dive. And we had hundreds of hammerheads very, very close. Um, and I still remember it really viscerally. Um, but basically, I, you know, I had, we were separated from the group. So we didn't have lots of people. We had very, very strong current and a place to hang out. And that, that combination let us get close to these because the current was blowing all of our bubbles horizontally away and not into this school. It was pretty cool. So the normal talks I give are like this. You know, we talk about big animals, charismatic megafauna, whales, sharks, dolphins. And um, those are the things that you see the most in, in, in the public about what's in the ocean and the things that people tend to rally around for conservation. Um, but actually, we spend a lot of time in places like this. And a few people in the audience have come with me on, on trips to, um, to places like this. This is a place called Biangabang in Indonesia. It is um, a subsistence living village, very, very small. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of diving that we call muck diving. And you'll hear, you know, someone will say, hey, I'm going on a muck dive. And most people will say, what? <laughs> and divers will say, yes, because they're very excited about muck. And it turns out that there's a magic formula for weird critters in the water. And this is the formula. So you have dark sand, uh, lots of water flow, some fresh water coming from an outlet somewhere, uh, trash and sewage. And you get muck, critter heaven muck. And this is sort of the magic formula. And um, this is what it looks like underwater. You know, it looks uh, terrible. And, um, you know, the first time you drop in, you just see this really silty sand. Um, and you might see a diaper floating by as well. And occasionally, you might have some trash. Um, but it's really amazing. And there are these um, critter hotspots all over. You know, we, we tend to go to these well, these are the ones I like the most in Indonesia. Um, basically, Lembe Strait is here, very well known for divers. This is Ambon, um, Alor, the Timor's here, and Komodo. So Bali's right here. That's probably somewhere you might have been. Um, and you can kind of hit all these spots if you go to, go to Indonesia. Uh, there are some things that are out in the open here. This is a school of platosis, like spiny catfish. Um, they're venomous, they have these little barbs, which might be hard to see here. But they school in these really tight balls, and these are juveniles, so this ball is probably the size of a large grapefruit. Um, and they get to be maybe six inches long, or maybe eight inches long, and you'll see much larger schools of these. And they sort of, the way they move is really cool. They're sort of picking food out of the sand, and one, one layer comes over the top, and it's like this ball that's rolling across the bottom. They don't even bother hiding. There's some other fish there. This is a white patch razor fish. Um, I've named him Dopey. <laughs> and um, these fish are also out in the open in the sand. They sleep in the sand, but they also dart into the sand very quickly if you, if you scare them. And um, so you'll see these fish uh, swimming around as well. Um, a bunch, there are things hiding everywhere. These are uh, a couple little gobies in the neck of a broken beer bottle. Uh, so everything you see probably has something hiding inside of it. Um, some critters will hide in very large objects. This is a hairy squat lobster in a, a barrel sponge. So many barrel sponges will have uh, lots of, they have little nooks and crannies for things like these to hide in. 
they're really hard to find though all of these animals because they they you know they're they're perfectly camouflaged and you have to go bring a light and and look for them and that's basically what we spend our time doing on these trips you know where we have guides who are very experienced to know uh, know this habitat really well and they just lead us around showing us this bizarre stuff this is a, a blenny hiding in its little hole uh, some animals will use other critters <laughs> as camouflage and protection. This is a little decorator crab, and he's got an upside-down jellyfish attached to him. And so you'll see a jelly, you know, on the bottom, and it's moving around, and it turns out that there's a crab underneath. Again, there are uh, symbiotic or commensal critters pretty much everywhere. These are very common corals you might find just laying on the sand. It's a mushroom coral. Um, investigate a little further, you might find a mushroom coral pipefish. I've only seen a couple of these in my life. Um, they just look like really delicate white strands of who knows what, and they've, but they've got faces. So when you dive a little more, you realize that there are things actually buried in the sand everywhere. So this is a stargazer. It looks relatively harmless like this, but if you light it differently, it can look really scary. <laughs> uh, this is like, you know, Halloween nightmare fish. Um, and uh, they look really scary like this, but they really just look awkward when they're out of the water, I mean, out of the, out of the sand. So this is one kind of erupting out of the sand um, for some reason and um, managed to get the shot. Really bizarre looking fish. There are other very nightmarish critters there. This is a bobbit worm. It's one of my favorite animals. I actually would really love to get a preserved specimen, just, but my wife has said no. <laughs> um, because they're, they're incredible, and we spent a lot of the, the last trip I was on just last month uh, photographing them because there happened to be a lot of them uh, on that particular trip. So these come out at night, and um, luckily they don't really come out. They just sort of stick their heads out. They're ambush predators, and so what they'll do is um, is just kind of wait for something to uh, disturb the water by them, and then they'll grab it. <laughs> it's a good way of, of living. These are, um, it's jaws, they're really, really strong. They're reported to be up to 10 feet long, and they're toxic, of course, they have toxic spines. Um, I actually lost a game of tug of war to one. We've, we had a, a bunch of fishermen throwing fish overboard on a trip, and I fed one a fish, and I, I had to, I had my, you know, I was standing on the bottom, and, and it pulled it out of my hands. You know, I was unwilling to go into the sand with it. <laughs> but really fascinating worm. Um, Dan here has a lot of pictures of this guy, too. This is a cardinal fish that we named Carl, and um, Carl got away. So you'll be happy to know that he survived. But this is typical, though, you know, you'll see it. The bobbit worm hunts this way. It sort of waits for something to swim over it and then grabs it. So again, everything has something hiding in it. This is a little file fish hiding behind a leaf on the bottom. Um, some fish skip the leaf part, I mean skip the hiding part and just resemble leaves. This is a juvenile uh, spade fish and um, they even move like leaves. Uh, this is not a great picture, but I love the fish. It's called a pearl fish, and it hides in the best place ever, which is in the anus of a sea cucumber. And uh, the first time I saw this fish, I, I freaked out. And there was a guy who had taken a picture of it, and then he was chimping, which, we, you know, when you look at your pictures after. And so he was just floating there, looking at his pictures with this pearl fish under him, and I, and I literally pushed him out of the way. So I have to get a picture of this thing, because I've read about them for so long. I've never seen one out. <laughs> So pearlfish, remember that. <laughs> really beautiful animals down there. This is a, a bobtail squid. They also come out at night, and they're um, iridescent, and um, just uh, they're like little jewels on the sand. Um, they don't, they're just out in the open. It's really a treat to find them. Octopi, or oct octopus, are in this habitat a lot. and. Um, you know, they can hide pretty much anywhere due to their, their body structure. You know, they have only their beak is hard, and so they can fit through anything the size of their beak. And um, they can be pretty curious. 
This is a Starry Night octopus, and it's uh, kind of playing with the lens of my camera. Uh, here's one that's eaten a fish. You can see the mouth of the fish here, or has captured one, is in the process of eating it. So they're capable of incredible camouflage. Um, this is actually one of the most colorful and brightly patterned um, octopus out there. It's called the Wonderpus. And you can see its, uh, its head here, and you can see its arms radiating out. Um, and it's decided like it would like to blend in. Um, but here's one when it's feeding, or when it's you know extended the webbing between all of its arms, and it's uh, it's trapped something uh, that it's going to try to grab, like a crab or a shrimp or something. Um, but this is the signature look for the wonder puss, and it's um, something that most divers are really interested in seeing. Every Critter pretty much has another critter living on it. This is an emperor shrimp, and uh, it's one of the more common commensal shrimps out there. Uh, it's tiny, and it's on a uh, cucumber, sea cucumber, which may have a pearl fish in it. And um, a closer look shows that it's eating some kind of parasitic copepod or something. Um, so this is all really, really small, and um, it's, it's an easy thing to miss if you're not uh, aware that it might be there. Uh, this is a fire urchin, again, something that looks like it might hurt you, and uh, they are indeed venomous. Um, but if you look on top, it has two little shrimp on it. Uh, these are Coleman shrimp, another treat to, that we look for. And um, they will snip away uh, the spines in a section on the top of the, the fire urchin and, and live there. Um, so these are Coleman shrimp. Uh, another um, animal that lives on them are... Uh, are these zebra crabs. Similarly, they, uh, they hang out on fire urchins. And sometimes you'll find a fire urchin with both zebra crabs and Coleman shrimp living on. Um, this is actually one of the hardest shots I've ever taken. <laughs> it doesn't look like much, um, but it's a tunicate, which is a sea squirt. And there's a little shrimp in here, this shrimp here. And I spent uh, pretty much an entire dive look, trying to get this picture. This is at night. And uh, every time I came near this tunicate, this shrimp would, would hide. It would run away. And I'd never seen it before, and so I was, I was really excited to find it. And um, I managed to get the shot by covering my light and allowing only a very small sliver of light you know, to, to come out so I could see where I was. Um, and then I, uh, I uh, turned the lights on full and just hoped that my camera would get it. <laughs> so it's very technical, the way I got the shot. Um, <laughs> But it worked. So you know, these are things that people who aren't in the water a lot would might be fascinated by just because they look pretty. But um, you know, we're fascinated because we're always looking for these weird critters that that are out there that no one has seen or very few people have seen. You know, this is an identified shrimp. Like people know what this shrimp is, but I always wonder, you know, how they how they found it and who identified it and why they cared. You know, but um, there's all sorts of stuff like this underwater. Again, emperor shrimp living on something else. This time it's a, a nudibranch, a sea slug. Uh, sea slugs are some of the brightest things in the water, you know, brightest and, and prettiest um, critters. And there are, you know, there are books that, uh, we have ID books that ID, you, know, you might have a thousand and one, there's one called a thousand and one nudibranchs. And um, it's a great book to look through to see the diversity of these slugs. Um, we don't seem to have this sort of thing on land, you know, slugs or something you don't really think of that much um, as being interesting. But underwater, they're one of the most interest interesting things and one of the most uh, pursued animals for uh, photography. A lot of things blend in. These are ghost pipefish. They're related to seahorses. There are two of them right here. And they look like weeds. Some of them, are, some of them have crazy colors and patterns on them. Um, which you might think would be a way for them to be spotted easily. But it turns out that the things that they're hiding next to also look like that. And, um, and they're almost always found near something they can blend into. Something else that blends well, these are Ambon scorpionfish. You can see an eye here. Scorpionfish are like linefish. They have um, spines on the top to deliver venom. And also, Related, another kind of scorpion fish. These are 
rhinopius or lacy scorpion fish. Crazy patterns. They have clear windows in their fins. Um, you know, these are, uh, they're bizarre because they look so colorful and, you know, these patterns are so crazy, but you will swim right by them on the reef without noticing they're there unless you're looking for them. And the reason is that if you don't light them, they look like this. So here's the mouth, eye, spines, and it looks, it blends in exactly to its environment. If you start to look at things that are really, really small, you, uh, the animals get weirder and weirder. So these are caprellids or skeleton shrimp, and um, they're one of my favorite things to photograph because they're always moving around and you know fighting and catching th catching little things in the water, um, which are also unidentifiable. Uh, but there's, they look like men in black aliens, you know, and I have to, I have to imagine that uh, there was some inspiration there. And these guys were cool because if if you if I backed up a little bit, there was actually a little baby frogfish under them. Um, and this is at a tiny, tiny scale. So frogfish are also beloved by divers. And they can be really bright like this as juveniles. Um, or they can blend, like this one is. Um, and when they get older, they look like blobs. You know, they're just sponges. They're perfectly camouflaged, um, which is how they eat. They're, they're an ambush predator. They have one of the fastest strikes in the animal kingdom. Um, they basically open their mouths so fast that anything in front of their mouth gets pulled in to their mouths um, because they're in the, in the water. All the water goes in their mouths. And this thing here, I'll show you in another picture, is actually a lure. So it'll flick this lure in front of its head, wait for a fish to come by, and eat it. <laughs> You're seeing a pattern here, maybe. <laughs> so there's a frogfish in this picture. Can most people see it? There's an eye right there, and here's the mouth. It's angled upward. This is actually on the last trip we took to Komodo at a place uh, called Cannibal Rock. And um, so what it does is just sits here, and it, when something swims over it, it eats it. <laughs> there you go. Um, so this is a picture of, of how they fish. So you can see the, an eye here, the mouth is right here, and this thing here is a lure. And at the end, there's something that looks like it might be a little shrimp. And it just flicks that little thing around. So you've heard of anglerfish, maybe. Anglerfish are the deep sea versions of, of frogfish. So I had, a I had a phase where I looked, you know, I spent a lot of dives looking for these, these corals. These are called xenia or pulsing xenia. They're one of the few corals that moves fast enough for us to see. So each one of these polyps will pulse, and you'll see them pulse to bring in water and they'll filter from the water that comes through. And there's a little crab here in the middle, which is perfectly camouflaged. And um, Xenia are host to all sorts of commensal critters. There's a shrimp. These are all, I don't actually know if they're rare. You know, I've only seen them a few times, but it might be because they're just really hard to find. You know, you might see, there might be an area that, the size of this room full of pulsing Xenia, and there might be some of these there but you have to commit and look for them uh, in order to find them to photograph. Here's another shrimp, very, very, uh, it's unusual. And um, I think this one is not described, but they're called broken back shrimps, the kind that you can see the, the back is broken or uh, has a turn in it. Again with a xenia, this looks like a xenia coral, right? These look like coral polyps. But this is actually a nudibranch. You can see the front, the head here. And they're called Phylodesmium. That's the genus. Um, and this is the Phylodesmium rudmani, after a scientist. And um, these are solar powered nudibranchs. So, just like those jellies that we saw, they host photosynthetic algae in their serrata here. And uh, they can use sunlight to survive after they reach a certain size. So, what they eat are things that have this algae in them so that they can then move them to move those colonies to parts of its body. On some trips, we've had lots of these things. This is actually the coral, right? It looks just like that thing you saw, but there's a nudibranch right here. Here's its head, and um, it, it's, it looks just like the coral here. These, these corals also host photosynthetic algae and are actually the source for these um, nudibranchs, so they'll eat uh, these host corals. 
This is another one. This is the uh, Jacobs, Jacobson's phylodesmium. It's right in the middle here. This thing is actually a slug. And it's burrowed into the, uh, its host uh, for whatever reason, maybe during the day. Maybe hard to see. It's right here, sticking out. So sometimes you can frame and light these things in a way that shows what they are. So it's a little bit more apparent that this might be a slug <laughs> in this picture because it's isolated against, uh, you know, it's a black background. This is the head right here. And in this picture, you can see it crawling towards its, this scene of coral. Um, and you can see it's also full of eggs here. Here's another shot. The head is right here. So there's another rule for us, uh, for those of us who hunt for critters, and that is uh, hairy is cool and, um, and rare. So anything you see that's hairy is probably going to excite a diver who goes to these places a lot. And this is a hairy octopus. Its eyes right here. There's his head and here a bunch of, uh, a bunch of arms. And when I saw this, I didn't know that Harry was cool. You know, it was early, it was 2007. Took a few pictures of this and then got in the boat and, you know, the dive guides freaked out. Everyone who didn't see it was sort of devastated that they had missed this Harry octopus sighting. And, um, and I, I don't know, I think I'd be like that now. <laughs> you know, if someone came up, yeah, I saw a Harry octopus. That's like a huge, you know, a huge bummer <laughs> that I didn't get to see it. Um, but this is the first one I saw. I've only seen, I think, one other one since then. Uh, and I hope to see more. Um, this was a, a super cool find from a trip to, uh, to Indonesia a few years ago. This was actually, believe it or not, the highlight of the trip for me. Um, it's an undescribed uh, festilla slug. There are a couple slugs. I think there are actually three slugs in this picture. This is a coral. It's on the side of a, of a large coral. And here's one slug right here. And here are uh, it's rhinophores up front, like these little things that stick out of its head. Here's another pair, and here's a third. So there are three here, and what they're doing is laying eggs. These are all little egg spirals. And so they're cruising across the coral, laying eggs. There's another picture that shows one that's easier to see. Um, now, this is actually the most I could isolate using photography. And the way I did it was I put the strobe basically in the side. So there's a strobe like on the, you know, out of the frame uh, at the same level as these guys. And I'm lighting it across so that everything casts shadows. So you can see that all these little ridges have cast shadows. So the texture comes out. And that's how this is isolated. So if, if I, you know, I took some pictures with the strobe basically uh, like at 45 degrees, which is a common thing for us to do. And you, you can't see it. You know, this thing blends in so well that it's not isolated. So, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of what we do when we're taking pictures underwater of these types of things is find ways to isolate the subject using lighting. Okay, this is a, it's a Phycocaris, I think that's what it's called, Phyco, yeah, that's the genus, and it's, or they're called the little green shrimp, and a couple of years ago, this became like the hot thing to find at some of these sites. I don't know, Carol, Carol have you seen one? Um, they are tiny. It's a broken back shrimp. You can see that big arch here. Um, and I had a phase <laughs> where we looked for these things as well and found all sorts of little, little shrimp that were hard to find, possibly undescribed, um, that are si the size of like a grain of rice or smaller. So these things are all tiny. And um, the last little critter I want to show is this thing. This is actually a, a, a hairy algae shrimp. It's hairy. <laughs> exciting for us. That's the eye, okay? And then this is the body, and you can see it. The body kind of bends like other broken back shrimp. And what I want to do is kind of, I'm, I'm going to back up and show you the environment that it was in. Okay, can anyone see it? Okay, right there. You see it right there? Okay, wait, I'm going to, I'll move out even more. Okay, so this is the top of a very small coral head. These tunicates are the same, same type that that little green shrimp was in. Remember that thing? Okay, ready? 
Okay, right there, you see it right there. And then this is what the coral head looks like. It's tiny. This coral head is actually quite small, and there is a, there's a shrimp in it, <laughs> which is right there. You see it there. So it's hard to tell scale from these, but you know these are tiny, tiny environments that we spend hours poring over. And um, I think you know the thing about this theme that was so exciting to me of being of, of being hidden is that um, pretty much the entire ocean is hidden to most people. You know, we think of the ocean as a as a food source, maybe a way to get iPads so over from Asia, um, but. We're also, you know, we're doing terrible things to the ocean, and because it's a hidden environment, it's not something that most people are aware of. So I think, you know, the the message here is really to to think about the ocean more, and maybe some of you might be inspired to go explore the ocean even here off of LA. There's a lot of the things I've shown have counterparts that are just off here, maybe off Long Beach. You can go in the water and and find nudibranchs, all sorts of very colorful things. The kelp environment here is amazing. It's something worth exploring. I mean, people travel from all around the world to go to the Channel Islands, and it's just right here. So, you know, if, you're, if you feel inspired, check it out. Scuba diving's not that hard. It can be cold here, though. Um, and just take the time to think about the ocean a little bit. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is sort of the next phase of what I've been doing. Um, this is uh, the last boat we were on in Indonesia, and one of the crew members is up here on top. And I used to climb on, you know, I would climb all the way up these masts to, um, to uh, uh, see what kind of view I could get, you know? And, um, and so I've started taking these little quadcopters out to, you know, to photograph the ocean from a different perspective. So this is a consumer quadcopter. I actually just started working at this company um, because now aerial imaging has suddenly taken over my life. And these are the kinds of views that we're getting with these, um, these quadcopters with cameras on them. So for the first time, you can see the environment from a different angle. And this shot, um, this is Dan. Dan's right here, <laughs> and he's swimming here. Um, but this is Cannibal Rock, and we did, I don't know, 12 to 15 dives on this rock on the last trip. And from the, you know, from the air, it looks like nothing, but people hadn't, I mean, nobody has seen this from the air. It's too remote to do a dedicated aerial, you know, like a, to take a helicopter over. No one's going to take a helicopter here to take a picture of this rock. But it's easy for us to, to send up something in the air 500 feet, um, and to get a shot of the environment that we're in uh, day after day. You can also put them above wildlife carefully in the right places. This is the whale shark uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and of course, you can capture kind of how we interact with them. And also capture some really interesting behavior. This is a, this vertical feeding behavior of a whale shark, and it's a screen grab from a video. So that's sort of my new destination. You know, I've been now, uh, I, actually, as of maybe three weeks, three weeks ago, working with this company, um, and uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of them, along with hopefully regu regulations to uh, control how we use them um, in the right way. And I think that's it. So if you have, uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Thank you so much for having me.